Good morning, everyone. Apologies uh, for the slight delay. There was some technical issue. So thank you for uh, joining us um, this Saturday. And just wanted to check before I start. Uh, can everyone uh, view uh, the slides? Great. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, once again, thank you for taking the time out to attend another True Blue webinar. So, today we're going to be talking about the Indian IT sector, predominantly focusing on the large caps. So, we all know that the Indian IT sector has been a shining light for India. And it was one of the first industries to become competitive globally. Infosys during its IPO couldn't even raise 13 crores without the help of underwriting. And right now its market cap is close to $75 billion. I was recently reading that an SME IPO just uh, a day or two ago who wanted to raise 16 crores has actually reached an oversubscription of over 6,000 crores. That shows uh, the magnitude of the growth of the Indian market and the Indian economy. So the Indian IT sector contributes roughly 7.5% of India's GDP, which is roughly $250 billion. As per NASCOM, the sector will continue to grow at 10% CAGR till 2030. So let's look at the IT, so IT sector structure in India. So broadly, in uh, the listed space, these are the kinds of companies which you would find listed on the Indian stock market. One, the, uh, it is the IT services, which is uh, the traditional IT services or managed services players like TCS, Infosys, LTI, Emphasis, etc. Second are the ERD companies, which are the pure play ERD companies like LTTS, KPIT, Scient, Tata Technology, and the likes. Third are the product companies of which of only a few of them exist in the Indian markets. A few of them are Oracle, Rate Gain, and Intellect. A lot of these software product companies are mainly in the unlisted space. And as the decade progresses, they should be uh, getting listed soon. So what's, what's the moat of India? What is the competitive advantage? of India. So while companies have tried to scale and expand in other countries like Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia, India has both scale and cost to its advantage. You can see that India ranks high on both scale as well on both cost as well as talent availability. So no company or no company who wants to scale can afford not to have an Indian growth strategy. So this, this is the job creation of the Indian IT industry over the past decade. A massive 30 lakh jobs have been created since 2010. This is a staggering number. The dotted lines are the three year averages. They are basically to smoothen out their yearly additions. So roughly close to two, two and a half lakh jobs have been added per year over the past decade. You can see that post 2016, there is a sharp, sharp decline in the job additions. So there was a, a rough slowdown during uh, which the industry went through during this period. And post COVID, there has been a sharp up move as well. 2023 ended with the highest three year average of job additions in the past decade. So however, we've all seen the news and it looks like 2024 will be one of the worst years for a headcount addition. So let's also look at the service sector of exports of the IT services industry. In 2000, the service sector. Continue. Can you screen in full screen? 
uh, people are having a little bit of difficulty in uh, watching okay. or looking at the screen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, give me a second, sorry. Is this better? Yes, it's better. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So uh, we are now looking at the services sector exports over the past uh, from the uh, from 2000. So you can see that at the beginning of um, the century, the services exports was just close to five uh, five billion dollars, whereas in 2022 it was close to 150 billion dollars, which is a 30x jump. So actually, this was the rise uh, or the beginning of the offshore model. So growth rates were very high at the turn of the century, which and the growth rates are close to if you look at the chart on the left hand side. So you can see that growth rates were close uh, or above 60 percent and it was close to 80 percent. So subsequent to GSC, there was a stark difference. So global growth uh, growth rate stalled and it stumbled uh, between 2013 and 2016 when there were a lot of visa issues, a lot of and it was a rise of as a service players and there was a lot of business investment as well. So over the past decade from 2010, actually the IT services exports grew at roughly 10 percent, whereas ER and exports roughly grew at uh, 13 percent. So a, a major uh, boost if you actually noticed that there was a sharp uptick in services sector exports in the past few years and a major reason for this growth was is the rise of uh, global cap capability centers or gccs as per uh, team lease you can also see that their acceptance ratios for uh, of offers is close to 70 percent for gccs versus 55 percent so for it firms so many employees prefer joining GCCs when compared to IT firms. Also on the right on the right hand side of the screen, you can see a chart which shows that the, uh, the GCC's percentage of the workforce in recent years is much higher and that's actually doubled to uh, 30% from 15% at the beginning of the decade. So what is leading to a lot of these employees preferring joining uh, uh, these GCCs? One is brand value, another is higher pay, better work culture, and of course the job profile itself is inherently better. So these GCCs generally have lower attrition compared to IT firms. One thing to note is that. ERD sector contributes close to 56% of uh, revenues of these GCCs and the their ERD exports have actually doubled over the past five years. And this was actually uh, a quote given by Vipros uh, human resource officer. He was talking about how the GCCs are pushing up their compensation and there is a war for talent. However, these GCCs predominantly actually only develop uh, in-house technology for core products and for core work sensitive products where uh, in, uh, with high intellectual property and customer data, which may have never been outsourced. Actually, you can see that over the past few years, there has been a lot of cost cutting pressures in project in the, these projects which cannot be outsourced so these product engineering companies are actually laying off people in their core markets or in their home markets globally and they are actually rehiring in india so sap labs recently stated that close to 40 percent of their r d strength globally is in india and we can we also saw that amd had recently announced a big r d center in india as well and in chennai there are a lot of uh, uh, you know, pharma firms who have announced like Pfizer, Novartis, etc., have announced GCCs and they are expanding their R&D centers in India. So, since these are core projects, they would have never been generally outsourced. So, the value addition of IT services companies are actually slightly different. So, both of these players can coexist together, and we have also seen in certain cases 
that the IT players themselves actually help the GCCs in setting up the GC, uh, setting up uh, the GCC in India. And subsequently, in the future, some of them, like Infosys, have actually taken over some of these uh, capability centers. So, but however, this is a headwind for margins uh, for the Indian IT sector in the, over the long term. So let's look at how the Indian IT uh, has how Indian IT revenues have grown over the past decade, and you can see that over the past decade, generally uh, the Indian IT sector has grown well above the uh, global uh, IT services spends. So clearly, the Indian IT services sector has gained market share over the past decades, and they have been consistently growing in the high single digits. And on that point, you can see in this chart that TCS uh, from in FY, so TCS in FY10 had a, a market share of roughly 0.8%, whereas at the end of the end of the decade, they had a market share of close to 2%. Same is the case with Infosys or and HCL Tech. However, uh, Wipro and Tech Mahindra have actually seen a flat line in their market share increase. So they have not really grown or gained share over the past decade. However, the biggest gainer globally in terms of market share has been Accenture. So they have gained share from 3% to close to find a five, over 5% over the past decade. So this is the rolling three-year chart of revenue growth that is from 20 over the past decade. So what this means is in 2013, this is the uh, revenue CAGR from 2012 to 2015. So um, if, if you just note the entry uh, entry uh, revenue growth CAGRs of TCS, which is a dark blue line, it's close to 25%. And for Infosys, it is close to 16%. Whereas the exit rate for TCS is close to 13%. Whereas for Infosys, it's close to 17%. And so clearly TCS has seen a revenue deceleration over the past decade and Infosys, which was struggling for revenue growth at the beginning of the decade, has actually seen a revenue acceleration post uh, COVID. Other firms have broadly been uh, range bound and have been, have been uh, in, a, in the same range. Our one thing to note is that all firms had a severe downtick during the periods of 2017 to 2020. So most of them, uh, were uh, you know slightly growing at uh, around 10 percent however wipro was the worst and they've uh, grown at uh, uh, close to five percent in over multiple time periods and on this point of uh, you know uh, on revenue growth actually there have been so if you just go to the previous uh, slide you can see that wipro uh, companies like wipro have seen a sharp acceleration there has been an acceleration in tech mahindra as well and there was an acceleration here for hcl tech in the year 2019 so all of this was actually driven by mna growth so this is the chart of the is the amount of uh, money spent by the tier 1 it companies over the past decade on mna one thing which is standing which is a standout in this chart is that tcs has actually not acquired or even spent anything on any m &A. So TCS is actually an organic growth engine. Accenture, on the other hand, has is a, is a serial acquirer and is on the other end of the spectrum. And Accenture has actually increased the amount of uh, money spent on m &A over the decade. So the red circles actually indicate the year of appointment of, the, of a new CEO. And if you notice, there is a trend. Once a new CEO is appointed, in the immediate two years uh, uh, succeeding that, we can see that there is a big M&A activity for every company. So most big M&A is post the introduction of new CEOs. And this is, all, of course, because the new CEO wants to st mark or stamp his authority on the firm and generally make a name for himself. So. This is actually, there was a study, it was an interesting study done by McKinsey, which stated that, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the years, in the first two years following the appointment of a new CEO, the number of deals done by the company actually increases by 50%. And subsequently, you can see that the number of deals towards the end of the tenure or towards uh, closer to his retirement 
is much lower than what it was initially before he joined so the 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 ceo actually becomes very risk averse towards the end of his tenure as he wants to you know maintain his name and maintain his stature in the company so this was um, the uh, study this was some of the other results 75% of the time there is a big management reshuffle and most and 50% of the time there is a big cost reduction program so why this is important is because there's a lot of ceo uh, shuffles which happen across the it industry especially uh, if, whether it's in the large caps mid caps and small caps and generally after a new ceo comes you know there is a big uh, revival in the stock price anticipating that there will be a cost reduction program and it is true 50% of the time whether it is uh, whether it is successful or not uh, you know only time can say so we have to make an assessment as uh, on a, on each ceo's appointment in the same study it was also found that generally there is a value premium attributed to organic growth companies which are growing in the similar uh, in similar range uh, when you compare companies which grow in the similar range companies with higher organic growth actually have a, a, a significant premium and outperform companies which have which do a lot of m and a this is all, uh, this is because generally the the m and a is done at a, uh, at a premium because you have to pay a takeover premium and m and a generally reduces roic and studies show that roughly half the m and a's mostly fail uh, uh, in their data set so organic growth is up, uh, is appreciate uh, appreciable but it does not mean that mna should not be done it is just that you need to have a strategy for mna you need to have an internal team and you should not uh, the, the the organization should have uh, should have a clear vision for the mna and of course the pr uh, premium paid should not be high so now that we have looked at the revenue let's look at the geographical mix for the tier 1 companies so roughly 60% of revenues come from north america 30% of revenues come from europe so close to 90% of revenues come from north america and europe and just 10% of revenues come from the rest of the world so since most of the revenues come from north america roughly two thirds there is actually a correlation between the s&p 500 revenue growth and the tier 1 it sector revenue growth so there is actually a 92% correlation so you can see on in the chart on the left that uh, the this correlation uh, how this correlation stands and the chart on the right is the correlation with the s&p 500 earnings growth so the correlation is uh, much lower it's at uh, 52% with the s&p 500 earnings growth so uh, this is also an important indicator to see the s&p 500 revenue growth is an important indicator to see where the it spends are heading globally and to project the uh, the growth rates of the it sector so now that we have looked at the geographical mix let's look at the segmental mix so one thing which is a stand out in this uh, in the segmental mix is that bfsi contributes close to one third of uh, indian it revenues so it is extremely consequential for the indian it sector so the other uh, the other uh, contributing sectors are life sciences uh, retail manufacturing etc and all of them contribute roughly close to 10% so bfsi is a very important uh, growth driver for the indian it space so now that we have looked at revenues let's look at margins so this is the margins for the uh, tier 1 it players over the past decade you can see on the left of the chart that at the beginning of the decade uh, in
yeah sorry uh, there was uh, some glitch so i, I hope uh, you can see my screen now yeah are you are audible and you can continue sure great so um, so i think uh, probably i've uh, i got lost last year so may i'll just probably begin again so this is the uh, margins uh, over the past decade for info, uh, for the it sector so if you look at the entry margins infosys and tcs had close to 28 29% margins at the beginning of the decade whereas at the end of the decade both uh, info, tcs ended the decade 24% margins whereas infosys ended the decade with a much lower margin at 21% so one thing is clear tcs has actually managed to relatively manage its margins much better and it's only in the last two years that there has been a decline under 25% whereas the margin drop for infosys has been a staggering 8% if you look at the other players they are always much lower than the top two players and they have also been kind of rage bound however in the past two years literally every every company has seen a margin decline this is uh, driven by high attrition low utilization and of uh, and competition with these global capability centers and startups who have increased the cost a uh, cost and demand for talent also another thing to note there's a common misconception that inr depreciation actually you know aids the it sector so the in in this dec in the last decade inr has usd inr has depreciated by 50% however margins have actually fallen uh, uh, significantly so while usd inr might play might, might improve margins in the near term in the long term it does not have any effect on margins because the cost uh, the cost impacts of that or the gain cost gains of that will have to be passed on eventually to the clients so that's one thing to note for this sector so let's look at the uh, let's look at tcs's margin profile so i know this uh, this is a lot of numbers on the chart but if you look at uh, this is the margin profile since its listing and if you see this uh, uh, this line of ebit margins so over the past uh, uh, decade you can see that tcs has had a, st a steady uh, ebit margins except in the past two years where it's actually reduced from 25 26% to under uh, to 24% and if you look at the employee cost it has actually been steadily increasing and it is now at close to 57% so uh subcontractor costs for tcs is uh, is hidden in other expenses however these costs have increased from 7.7 percent uh, in 2017 to right now it's close to 10 percent however the other expenses have been managed because all these companies have seen a two three percent decline in travel costs and there has been also a decline in uh, facilities costs so uh, tcs has actually kind of been able to uh, maintain its margins and they should uh, see some kind of uptick as the employee costs uh, reduce and as the subcontractor costs reduce going forward however if you look at uh, infosys's margins over the past decade and especially over the last 5 to 7 years you can you can see that while uh, employee cost has actually reduced or has remained range bound or reduced in the past few years the subcontractor cost has really shot up so subcontractor cost has uh, increased from increased close to 10% for infosys and it was much lower before and they have uh, post the introduction of the new ceo they have actually changed the delivery model so there are a lot of software uh, reselling or software packages involved in their delivery model so that is also uh, in, uh, that those costs have also increased and of course the, their margins were helped by the other expenses which have gone from 10% to 6% over the past few years so one thing is clear one thing which is clear for uh, about infosys is that post the introduction of the new ceo in 2017 you can see that the new ceo has been very aggressive he, it looks like his strategy has been to gain market share you can see uh, you would have seen how their uh, revenue growth accelerated and they did not really focus uh, much on margins and this is this can be clearly seen in the margin decline over the past 5 to 6 years so in the recent calls they have announced an internal uh, they uh, announced that they're going to focus on margins again and they have an internal program program to improve margins so now that we've looked at the past at the past decade 
So let's look at how do we even go about valuing these companies. So what actually drives shareholder returns? There are two aspects to it. One is price appreciation, of course, and the other aspect is dividends. Most people actually do not pay attention to dividends, but dividends are an important factor for total shareholder returns. So price is just one aspect of it. So price is driven by EPS growth and PE rating. So what actually drives P e ratios? So this is the uh, this is the formula and the derivation on the left. So this is a simple uh, one stage garden growth model which has been derived. So you can see that uh, P actually depends on two aspects. ROIC, that is return on invested capital and, and earnings growth. So, our, uh, so generally people focus on, uh, focus a lot on growth, but fail to appreciate ROIC. Actually, not all growth is equal. You can see that uh, just by this formula that higher the ROIC, will, the higher the PE ratio. So using that formula, I've just created a table which shows the different P ratios for different ROICs and different growth rates, taking a cost of capital of 12%, which is roughly what the Nifty has delivered over the past decades. So you can see that for different growth rates and, for, and for, as the ROIC increases, the P ratio also jumps. So for example, how, to, how you read this is, for a 30% ROIC company, which which can grow at nine percent, it it deserves a PE ratio of twenty three x. Whereas for a fifty percent ROIC company, for the same nine percent, you can, you can pay up up to twenty seven x multi PE multiple. So we, we will be analyzing this. So what has actually been the growth rate for these companies over the past three years? You can see that the operating profits for TCS, Infosys, HCL Tech, Wipro. Uh, all of them have been growing at close to double digits, roughly around 10% over the past uh, uh, over the past decade. And for certain uh, certain companies like Infosys, it has actually accelerated over the past few years. So, so uh, to, uh, this is an inference from the justified P ratio table. So this is basically the delta in valuations for the same growth. For example. Uh, for the same growth and change in ROIC. For example, when the ROIC increases from 20% to 30% and for a 9% growth rate, which is the same growth rate, what will be the valuation or the PE uh, P differential, differential? So this, uh, so you can see that there is a 27% valuation re-rating when a 20% ROIC company Goes to a thirty uh, becomes a thirty percent ROIC company at the same nine percent growth rate, and the valuation re rating increases uh, from uh, as the growth rate also incre uh, increases. However, from this chart, you must uh, you must notice that as the ROIC base keeps increasing, the valuation re rating reduces. So, for example, when a forty percent ROIC company goes to a fifty percent ROIC. For the same thirty, uh, for the same ten percent growth rate, so uh, the valuation uh, re-rating is only a mere seven percent. So the valuation re-rating happens at when uh, from a low base or low base of ROIC. So that is where actually multi baggers are made. And just for uh, for an example, if if there was I did the math, and if there was a, a company which is going from fifteen percent ROIC to thirty percent ROIC for a a 10% growth rate, the valuation re-rating is actually 100%. So you get a doubler just by valuation re-rating. So the lo lower the base ROIC going to a higher ROIC, higher the valuation re-rating. So what is the delta in valuations for the same ROIC? That is for 20% ROIC as the growth rate increases from 6% to 7% and from 7 to 8 and 8 to 9. What is the valuation delta? It's pretty simple. Higher the growth for the same ROIC, higher the growth rate, the better because the ROIC is the same. However, you must also in this table also you must uh, you can note an interesting fact that the PE ratio or the PE re rating actually plateaus after a certain increase in ROIC. For example, 
at a 40% ROIC, the jump from 9% to 10% is a 45% re-rating. And it is the same for a 50% ROIC company. That is a 50% ROIC company going from 9 to 10% growth at the same valuation re-rating. So these are just the inferences. So for a fixed growth and ROIC and with a variable ROIC, a low ROIC to high ROIC leads to a significant increase in P. So lower the base, the better. And after a certain point, an increase in ROIC doesn't matter too much. And for fixed ROIC, higher the growth, the better. So in essence, what this, the table says is that for low ROIC companies, they should try to improve their ROIC and grow faster. Whereas for already existing uh, uh, companies with high ROIC, only growth rate matters. So we've looked at the price appreciation. Now let's look at dividend payouts. So uh, there is a clear uh, stark difference in the dividend or the capital allocation policy of these companies prior to 2018 and 2018 onwards. So to in 2018, as growth rates slowed down and the Nifty IT index was close to a decade low in valuations, the company started paying out more. So you can see that the payout ratio in increased for every most companies and certain companies it has increased in the past few years. So it's close to 80, 90 percent. Uh, uh, basically, whatever free cash they generate, they are paying it out. For Infosys, they've actually announced a buyback post uh, FY23 closure. So it's actually much higher than 57%. So most of them pay close to 90% of their earnings. And this is the uh, Indian IT's ROICs uh, when you reduce cash over the past decade. So you can see again, generally the, uh, the business model is such that the, they have intrinsically have high ROICs. However, post-2018, you can see that as they started paying out more, the ROIC of the business has actually substantially increased for most companies. One thing to note is that many of these companies, for example, TCS, has an ROE of only, that is return on equity, of only close to 45 to 50%, whereas their ROIC net cash is close to 96%. So their cash, most of these companies have a huge cash balance on their balance sheet, which is dragging their return ratios. So they need to have a better capital allocation policy in the future. They either have to pay them out, pay out the cash or they have to utilize it for m and Otherwise, it's just dragging these return ratios. So we had actually spoken about how the big change in uh, valuation re-rating happens from low ROIC to high ROIC. However, this was a study uh, which was done over three decades in rolling three year periods. So it, it, it found that um, so it found that in the in the beginning of the study and uh, uh, companies which were in the in the best quintile, only uh, you know roughly fifty percent of them stayed in the best quintile at the end of three decades, whereas forty percent of companies which were in the worst quintile stayed in the same quintile post three decades. So this shows that you know betting on turnarounds is very hard. High ROIC companies generally be, uh, remain high ROIC companies. This is purely because their business models are intrinsically so. So another thing to note is that. 15% of companies which were the best became the worst three decades later, and 12% of companies which were the worst became the best three decades later. So one company, one good company out of every six to seven goes bad, but one company, only one company out of every bad company becomes good. So finding turnarounds and betting on turnarounds is very hard. And this is, I mean, the table clearly shows that. So now that we've talk, spoken about PE ratios, let's look at the historical valuations. So this is the uh, historical valuations of the Nifty IT index. And you can see that uh, the, the, the middle orange line is the median PE and the rectangular box is the standard, uh, standard deviation from the mean. You can see that we are slightly above uh, the median right now but we are below the uh, below the standard deviation and we had also noticed that for a high ROIC company say 40 50 percent if they're growing at high single digits uh, 25 to 28 times multiple is pretty fair value so right now the sector is kind of it's neither cheap 
uh, not expensive so it's kind of, it's fairly valued and you have also seen that the sector bottoms out generally at close to 15 p in the past but at 15 p you just have to back the truck and uh, load up on the sector so so generally people don't look at uh, price to book multiples uh, for services companies and fairly so because they don't really have any assets but uh, mathematically at least there is a relationship between earnings and book value multiples so the price to book is just the pe ratio into the roe uh, multiplied by the roe of the company there is the roe is the link between earnings and book value multiples so assuming the justified pe as we saw in the table before for tcs is close to 25x its roe is you know close to 50% so the justified price to book will be 25 into 0.5 that is 12 and a half times and if you actually look at the price to book multiple of tcs right now it's close to 12 and a half times so roughly uh, if you look at the sector as a whole it's trading at you know rough, uh, close to its uh, median price to book and this is the dividend yield of the sector over the past decade and uh, it's uh, it, it's close to its highs in the in terms of dividend yield however total payout yields which uh, include buybacks are actually much higher so payout yields for the sector as a whole is close to 4% and for certain companies it's more than 4% it's close to 5% and this is the nifty it to uh, nifty ratio chart so you can see that at the beginning of the century at the turn of the century uh the uh, nifty it index found a significant portion of uh, nifty and it was actually the ratio was more than 4 whereas uh, subsequent to that it has been trading in a range and post covid actually kind of uh, uh, you know b- broke out of that range but if, uh, but we are trading kind of in line uh, even on this ratio so this again shows that we are neither cheap nor expensive so we are kind of fairly valued so now that we have looked at the past and we've seen how to value these companies let's look at the future so if you look at the past 5 decades of world gdp growth gdp growth and especially in the past 3 decades gdp growth has been uh, driven mostly by productivity growth and not job growth so the importance of productivity growth is only going to accentuate going forward we need more measures to improve productivity growth if we want to maintain gdp growth at 3% cagr for the next decade as well so so th- these are the different uh, foundational models or large language models launched by m- various companies in the past 5 to 6 years so with the introduction of chat gpt just exactly one year ago it kind of uh, democratized ai to the to the masses so you can see that uh chat gpt was actually uh, launched uh, and is based on gpt3 and subsequently in 2000 uh, subsequently this year gpt4 also was launched and it is trained at a much higher with much higher parameters so th- there are a lot of models which have there are a lot of companies trying to build these large language models whether it's google whether it's meta interestingly meta has actually taken uh, an open so uh, as a, uh, meta's model is actually open source so that's pretty unique whereas others uh, no one else is taking that route so why is this important so these models are able to understand unstructured data till now the automation or the ai tools were not able to do that so most data generally is unstructured so gen- uh, what usually used to happen is that data analysts used to create dashboards uh, to uh, to understand they used to clean data and then managers used to interpret this data so only structured data was queryable so to speak in the in the past but now uh, you know these large language models have changed that so this was actually a study which was done by uh, mckinsey so uh, this was on the adoption of automation over the past few decades uh, and sorry in the next few decades so they had uh, so the colored lines are the updated scenarios after the introduction of generative ai and the dotted lines was the predictions Uh, were the predictions they had done uh, in 2017 so you can see that the midpoint of uh, midpoint of the colored lines compared to the dotted lines have actually accelerated have actually you know been advanced by a decade so mckinsey expects that 
roughly 50% of the current work activities will be automated by 2045. So this was uh, uh, you know, an article in the Financial Times. So they, uh, they had stated that generative AI, generally we know that it's very good at creative work. So uh, they had done a study and they found that post the launch of uh, chat GPT, the work, uh, the number of jobs, as well as um, the amount of uh, money earned, uh, um, amount of money earned actually saw uh, you know, a sharp decline post uh, the launch of chat GPT, especially for writing and editing jobs. This was on an online uh, freelancing platform. So LLMs generally are very good at creative work. And this was a study actually done by Harvard Business School with BCG. So in this study, they found that AI assisted, consult uh, AI -assisted consultants, uh, all of them saw a good boost in their productivity. However, an interesting point to note is that, which is on the left side of the chart, is that the bottom half of the skilled participants actually saw a 43% boost in the uh, work they did compared to the top half of the skilled participants. And you can see that, so these are the two uh, lines. And uh, so broadly, uh, the red line is the, pe uh, the people who use chat GPT. You can see that their score on the tasks was much higher for people who are lower skilled. And this actually converges to the same. So there was no difference between people who use chat GPT or not for higher skilled participants. So the broad takeaway is that the biggest performance gains actually are for the lower skilled participants. Another um, outcome of the study was that AI assisted consultants actually fared worse in nuanced problem statements, which require qualitative insights. So they fared, they fared worse in problems which required required them to read between the lines and speak to people and you know require which require qualitative insights. So this was part of the same study. So they found that you know that uh, if you use GPT-4, the quality of uh, the tasks there was a forty percent increase in the quality of the tasks. There was a twenty five percent increase in the speed of completion, and there was a twelve percent increase in the complete uh, the task completion rate so there was an increase across the board in activities when you use uh, when they used gpt4 so this was uh, uh, this was the data which was put out by github so Git, uh, github also kind of concluded to the same point they concurred on the same point they stated that you know less experienced developers have you know greater advantage with ai so it it looks like the, the less experienced developers have uh, you know have a higher acceptance rate of the pro, of the code which is put out by GitHub Copilot, whereas the more experienced developers you know have a, have a lower acceptance rate of the code which is put out by GitHub GitHub Copilot, which is uh, Copilot's uh, software to automate software development. So, HCL Tech CEO has also stated that you know AI can probably bring thirty percent efficiency to the software development process now. So how does this impact IT companies? So we, it's I think it's been clearly stated that the lower rung of the employee base with lower skills will see the max maximum output increase. So if you actually look at the pyramid, uh, employee pyramid of the companies of the IT companies, most of them have have a higher mix of junior employees, and they're actually accelerating that. They're trying to hire more freshers to improve margins. So these junior employees. Can actually take, uh, you know, can potentially benefit from these tools to improve productivity and quality of work. So, enterprise adoption of AI is actually in very early stages. So, most of them are in, uh, you know, just only first of all, only sixty percent of them are even considering adopting. Forty percent are not even have not even made a decision yet. Second. Most of the work of the people who are even you know uh, began begin to adopt is only in POC stage. Roughly forty to sixty percent are in early testing or POC stage. So enterprise adoption of AI is a while away. So the death of the IT sector as such is uh, very premature. And this was another interesting data point, uh, you know, chart put out by Gartner. So this is actually the hype cycle 
for AI uh, for uh, different technologies. And if you look at generative AI and foundational models, it's actually at the peak of inflated expectations. And uh, they are actually colored dark blue. So they're stating that they, they, uh, these, uh, these uh, generative, generative AI and foundational models will actually take five to 10 years to reach the plateau of productivity. So adoption of these, of these tech, of the tech for enterprises will at least take a decade. So what are the general risks of these of the tech? One, it's intellectual property, fairness, and security. And the VP actually, so uh, the VP of Microsoft had actually uh, stated in, a, in an interview that most companies want to bring, uh, do not want, uh, you know, want to create an environment where they can access and bring LLMs into their own environment and they want to control the data structures. So they do not want to lose control of their uh, for their data and they do not because they don't want to train other people's models. So this is a big risk and uh, uh, amongst the uh, in the minds of clients. And Verizon has also stated that their top priority is data privacy and to ensure data does not leak to these LLMs. So to summarize, it's too early to conclude how it will play out so even the CEOs are changing every month, so we don't really know, you know, what's happening. But right now, the contribution to deal wins is le less than 0.5%. So it's pretty inconsequential as of now. So the potential is, so these IT companies generally have annual productivity gains inbuilt in their IT contracts, which they have to deliver to the clients. So these tools can actually accelerate that and help them in, uh, you know, giving this productivity to their, to their clients. So large enterprises are actually searching for use cases. So they and they need a partner like IT companies for efficient transformation. One major uh, trend which will reaccelerate is cloud adoption. For even adopting these uh, technologies, you need data first. And first, the data has to be on cloud because you need a lot of compute. And uh, so only 30% of workloads are on the cloud now. So cloud adoption is actually going to see a uh, good reacceleration. Uh, re Enterprises are of course worried about the leakage of data, and the pyramiding strategy, as we saw, you know, could improve margins. So the quality and the speed of uh, work will also lead to an incre increased utilization. And we saw that there's a you know good correlation with the S&P 500 revenue growth. So we have seen many companies like say Microsoft adding the uh, you know making the uh, making uh, their ai tools a revenue driver for them so this could be a revenue driver for many clients in turn leading to more tech investments so now let's look at the present so what's happening right now in the it sector so you can see that from the beginning of the year and to the end of q2 most companies have seen a uh, you know the commentary has gotten gradually worse through the year so there is a slowdown across sectors and across geographies. How, um, however, one thing to note is that you know healthcare has been consistently doing well and they're growing. Uh, in the uh, vertical is growing fast, and manufacturing has also been doing well because global manufacturing has been doing well. And you can also see that in the September quarter, US has actually rebounded by 0.6 percent. So that is also a good sign for the future. And this shows that the IT sector generally is very nimble. So as the revenue drops, they sharply reduce their hiring and they improve their utilization rates. So on the left, you can see that. So this is the first time actually over the past decade, there have been four subsequent quarters of negative headcount addition. So uh, and utilizations have risen as well. So actually amidst all this, uh, all the noise in the sector. Actually, if you look at it year to date, the Nifty IT index has uh, outperformed the uh, Nifty 50. So it's uh, the IT index has given a 39.5% uh, price return. So now let's look at the flows. So if you look at the IT sector, uh, I, I, this is the DIA positioning. And if you notice the aggregate flows in the year to date or over the past year, it's actually been extremely high. It's, on, it's only second to the BFSA sector. So the IT sector has seen 17,000 crores of uh, net flows in, uh, to the sector. 
However, if you look at the FII positioning, we all know that FII, uh, you know, positioning and FII weightage in the index is at decade and lows. So, however, if so, if you look at the uh, FII positioning, you can see that the aggregate flows close. They have sold close to one uh, one point eight billion dollars. So, FIs have been con continuously selling the IT sector over the past year. So now, even though the sector has seen a revenue slowdown over the past few quarters, if you actually look at the deal wins, the deal wins have uh, have been staggeringly high, especially over the past two quarters. So uh, this is broadly because because there has been an increase in cost optimization and cost takeout deals, and there has been a reduction in revenue growth, and despite these huge deals, because the older deals are not renewing. And they are being pushed, uh, have not been renewed, and they have been pushed, they're being pushed out. And also, the deal tenures have been increasing. So, Cognizant, I think, had stated that the de their deal tenures have increased by close to 40%. So, that's why, despite these deals, there has been a deceleration in the uh, revenue growth. However, this, of course, has to turn at some point. So, that could potentially be uh, the year, uh, the, the next year. So now let's look at some projections given by certain analysts. So this is Gartner, which is an industry analyst. So they are Gartner is projecting that 2024 there will be a 10 and a half percent increase. So there'll be an acceleration in the growth rate for IT services. And this was a projection by McKinsey. So McKinsey is projecting up to 2027, and they are saying that. The sector as a whole will grow at 7% CAGR till uh, over the, in the next three to four years. And you, they have also projected that you know the ERD space will be growing at double digits at, in the same time period. So moving on to the sell side consensus. So if you look at the sell side consensus, most of them, you know, it's be they're baking in high single digit revenue growth, revenue growth and a bit, a bit margins to have to see an uptick. So more, uh, most of these companies, at least the tier one companies, are trading roughly, uh, roughly at around 20x one year forward uh, multiples. And uh, if if you're looking at two year forward, it's significantly lower. So to conclude, what we've spoken about today, if you look at revenue, you see in Gartner's growth estimates, McKinsey's the sell side consensus. The S&P 500 revenue growth estimate is actually 5.5% in 2024. So this is uh, coupled with strong de uh, deal wins. So it looks like it looks like there will be an accident. You know, there will be a bounce back in the next two years. However, the sector will be back to its historic high single-digit growth rates, and it will not grow uh, in the you know uh, low double digits or the mid teens like it did in uh, 2021 and 2022. On the margin front, it looks like uh, margins have bottomed out. So attrition can is back to pre-COVID levels. Utilizations can trend uh, trend upwards. Maybe there's potential to, for some AI-led gains. However, the uh, rise of GCCs can you know affect uh, the uh, the employee costs in the long term. And there is a, a revival of travel and facilities expenses. That is the return to office expenses could be a headwind for these for the margins. So the pay, payout yield roughly for the sector is right now close to 4%. However, it's higher for certain stocks. And so uh, if you look at the valuations, the sector is not extremely cheap, but it's fairly valued. So you will have to make, uh, you know, so it's, it's fairly valued. So you have to make a bottom up, bottom up uh, uh, decision for the uh, for specific stocks. And flows, their flows have been very strong. However, any revival in FIA flows is a positive for the sector. So generally, if you look at the payout yields, it's at 4% now. However, uh, uh, you know, the IT index bottoms out at close to 5% free cash flow yields. So any drawdowns from here on is actually a buying opportunities. Some individual stocks are probably trading at, uh, you know, close to those 5% free cash flow yields even now. So uh, we've come to the end of um, the uh, presentation. So we'll just talk about, uh, the product, which is uh, True Blue, so it, so this is the I thought way 
of our, basically our investment philosophy and this is across products this is uh, not specific to true blue so we generally take a long term focus we look at the next 3 to 5 years at least we try to be in areas you know non consensus we focus we take a bottom up approach and there is a high focus on risk management so true blue is you know 100% pure large cap there is a high active share so we only own 22 stocks we there is it's a buy and hold strategy there's low churn and zero fixed fees so on this point there are certain stocks in the uh, you know nifty which have we because it's a market weighted index they have a high market share because high weight in the index because their promoter share is lower so for example tcs has a lower share than infosys because its promoter holding is higher so we don't believe that that should uh, you know be the reason especially given the uh, organic growth engine that tcs is so we have actually a higher higher weight in our portfolio for tcs and we uh, so you can see that in the top 10 stocks there are many stocks which are which uh, which are not even there in the nifty 50 in the top 10 so we are all of them are part of the nifty 50 but the weightage significantly differs so for example bajaj auto is uh, is our uh, you know is in the top 5 for us whereas in the nifty it will be close to the bottom so we we have we take a high active share and generally mutual funds do not take cannot take uh, uh, you know uh, if you look at other large cap funds they generally restrict themselves to a 10% weight for say a company like hdfc bank so but we we do not we do not restrict ourselves like that so just on another data point on it so right now the it index in the nifty 50 is close to 13% which is well below long term averages whereas we have a 16% weight so the whose who, product suitability it's for first time investors who are new to the market and who do not want want a lot of volatility and people who are closer to retirement who want to build their retirement corpus family offices who have a mandate and other institutional investors so our endeavor is to focus make you know make high risk adjusted returns and our time frame we always uh, you know look at uh, look ourselves on a 3 year rolling time frame so this is um, so this is uh, so the fund is managed by mr sham shekar and mr gr balaji and this is our research team so we have uh, uh, a lot of people who are who are very accomplished and this is the uh, portfolio uh, true blues performance uh, so since inception and over the past one and two years so one thing to note here is that you know we have uh, our beta is actually 0.73 so our risk adjusted returns are much higher and we have very high active share so for example bajaj auto uh, for us is uh, our weight in this uh, is at 6 and 6.7% whereas the entire auto sector weight in the nifty is only 6.3% so uh, we have actually really done well you know bajaj auto is close to 52 week high so yeah we take a very uh, we take its uh, high active bets in the portfolio so yeah uh, this uh, presentation's over so i am open to taking questions right now so if you have questions uh, please uh, uh, put them in the chat box yeah let, let me just share
yeah so our inception date uh, someone's asking for the inception date uh, mr suren so our inception date is you can see this it's on the screen now it's uh, 5th march 2021 so uh, i think mr baskar is asking will any large cap company grab the ai space so uh, i so none of these uh, large cap uh, companies so broadly they are services players so that's their dna and uh, they are not going to be making any uh, you know breathtaking innovations as such so they will be you know helping these companies find use cases helping them transition and first of most of them have not even have not even uh, gone uh, you know shifted or migrated to the cloud so uh, there are, there are, there will be a lot of use cases where these companies uh, where the clients will have to uh, will have, will need the help of uh, it services players but directly they are, they are not going to be making any foundational models yet um i'm sorry uh, mr ran in the subramaniam i'm uh, i'm not uh, clear as to what your question is if you could probably just rephrase that yeah uh, yeah mr suren so he uh, mr suren as uh based on your ai slides this ai only help lower skilled engineers and uh, not that much for higher skilled engineer so uh, actually th- that is not the case uh, so ai helps everybody so the percentage difference it makes for lower skilled engineers is much higher so uh, but it, even for higher skilled engineers there is an improvement close to 20% improvement in the quality and quantity of work so mr uh, baskar as what is the uh, it allocation in uh, the true blue portfolio so the true blue portfolio actually right now has close to 17% allocation to uh, the it space so mr jay prakash has which are the fundamental ratios uh, will you uh, will i follow in order to identify profitable growth of it companies so that's where you know you uh, there is no set of rules but you can look at the uh, so you you have to look at whether the growth is driven by mna so whether these whether the deal uh, the client additions for these companies across categories are stable so that you know the pro, uh, so that the growth can be uh, uh, the growth is consistent and is uh, can be uh, you know it's organic and uh, you can also see whether the uh, these companies are done are doing are indulging in a lot of m and a uh, and whether and how much they are paying for example i think wipro and uh, techm so they had done a big m and a in 2021 at the height of uh, uh, at the height of the at the peak of valuations and subsequently and they had to pay top dollar and subsequently uh, they had uh, you know the market turned they they weren't able to integrate these companies as well and they didn't really get the roi so how they may they might get uh, you know they might uh, it might help, end up helping them going forward but you have to see how these companies act at different points in time and how their capital allocation is uh, at these points in time so uh, mr uh, mr vinod as is it adoption uh, sorry is ai adoption good for it companies or employees or is there any disruption in the sector because of ai adoption so so far you know it's it seems to be that uh, ai adoption is, is actually seems to be potentially beneficial for it companies because uh, you know uh, they, they have to keep delivering 
an improvement in uh, uh, they have to keep delivering an improvement in productivity for their clients so this actually helps them in improving their productivity and so that uh, this can also stabilize their margins so as and they are work, all of all it companies are actually working with clients to find use cases to test use cases and uh, uh, there's a lot of work to be done on the data side because to even uh, implement uh, you know uh, foundational models you need first of all you need data uh, you need to collect data you need to store data in a certain way but uh, most companies have not really done that so there's a lot of work to be done actually to get to that stage uh, where you can where an enterprise can use these foundational models and it companies you know will be helping uh, uh, their clients in getting to that stage and potentially finding uh, new uh, you know new avenues for growth as well so uh, i think mr suren has from your analysis which company in india is adopting to ai fast so at least i mean uh, since we are talking about uh, the it services companies i mean uh, the tier 1 companies most of them have may you know have had partnerships with uh, the hyperscalers they are uh, trying to upskill uh, their employees and they are working with clients or, uh, you know uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, proof of concepts to find out uh, the use cases for their clients so it's uh, i don't i mean it's too early to say which com you know which company is adopting to ai fast but all of them are working towards it and uh, Mr. Ananda Subramaniam says, "Shall we go for IT which focuses on AI front and not conventional IT?" Right. So, I mean, so these are two different uh, cases. At least in the listed space in India, there is no uh, generally uh, mostly the the companies are uh, you know uh, the listed companies are uh, conventional IT services players. So, these conventional IT services players. just like how they did before in all tech transitions they will be helping uh, their clients to uh, to uh, evolve and adopt new technology so uh, yeah, of course the growth rates are not going to be high uh, like uh, for say uh, you know a traditional tech player but uh, you need to see what your expectation is when you are buying into these companies if you are going to make if you if you want to make uh, you know 12 mid teens of uh, stock returns then these companies itself uh, you know they they, uh, they they can deliver that uh, thank you mr prashant so he saying there are other Uh, robot uh, rpa tools like ui path uh, automation anywhere which completely auto, auto automate routine procedures so this will in turn reduce work workforce in big it services companies there can be in house uh, hiring so instead of outsourcing any thoughts so yeah so i mean i think rpa has been spoken about for over a decade or maybe close to past 5 to 7 years so all of these tools actually help uh you know the uh, all of these tools actually kind of help uh, it services companies in automating a lot of procedures so to uh, so as to reduce their internal costs so uh, and these costs will then uh, be transferred to their clients and also one has to note that the i mean the uh, the role that these companies play actually i think accenture ceo stated it uh, pretty well they actually help in compress transformation so these uh, so company uh, all their clients want to transform uh, can actually transform and adopt to new technology but if they want to do it in house they it will take time for them however if they give it to uh, an it services player or if they outsource it then they can do it in an accelerated way and without affecting their own uh, pnl and balance sheet As, uh, so especially right now most companies are focusing on cost cutting so for compressed transformation or accelerated transformation it actually is beneficial for uh, these kind of big it players and most of these companies actually are uh, you know are uh, partnering with you know, say ui path or automation anywhere anyway so for basically you know as a service integrator
so um yeah so mr jay prakash has which it company has highest non linear revenue growth currently and in the future so uh, at least uh, i mean if you want non linear revenue growth you will have to look at software product companies because it services companies globally itself is gro- growing at a certain rate so uh, if you want to grow at you know at a high rate say even in the mid teens you need to grow again market share so uh, to grow at you know to grow non linearly in the services space is going to be very hard but this is uh, possible you know in in the product space so uh, you have to look at product companies but mo- mo- many product companies are not listed in in, uh, in india so far i think uh, mr uh, baskar uh, has uh, he says that he is working in dubai as a software developer and he can see a lot of competition from low cost employees from different comp- countries than indian employees please come in so uh, yes uh, that's a very valid point so that's why initially i had uh, i had shared this uh, chart so we can see even global companies like epam etc so most of them they are hired from you know in uh, eastern european countries like romania bulgaria etc and they are also hired a lot from southeast asian countries however if these companies after a certain scale if they want to grow you you have to come to india because india only india has that many uh, number, uh, you know the amount of talent especially educated talent whereas the population itself in these countries is very low so uh, yeah so that's actually the competitive advantage for india so uh, so mr uh, jay prakash as you know which company has the highest manufacturing vertical com- uh, uh, catering to the us market so actually uh, we only know the highest manufacturing uh, mix overall we don't know what percentage of the manufacturing is catering to the us and europe however if you look at tier 1 it hcl tech has close to 20% in uh, manufacturing which is the highest uh this is also because they have a big er and d division and uh, uh, yeah so they have the highest uh, share Could you please mention the listed product companies in India? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, there are a few. So uh, I, I think there's Oracle Financial. Then there is uh, uh, Rate Gain, which was recently listed. Intellect and a few few others. So Mr. Anand Subramanian asks, AI in health industry is doing good. so are they adaptable how about the future in health or hospitals uh, so of course so, so the use cases in uh, the uh, in the healthcare sector or the life sciences sector is varying so for example in uh, the r&d space uh, you know ai or uh, AI, ai can be used to accelerate the r&d timeline and the and can reduce the r&d uh, cost so it can be used you know in the r&d space whether how it can be used in hospitals uh, so so hospitals generally have a ton of data with respect to the client clients i mean their patients history so if they had been meticulous in collecting the data for, for so they say the past 10 to 20 years then they can use it on that data to you know um, to improve their uh, uh, to improve their suggestions and recommendations to patients so actually i, I have seen certain uh, startups doing uh, trying to do this as well thank you suren
Yeah, Mr. Jay Prakash asks who's having the highest uh, revenue per employee and better gross margins. So, uh, in the in the tier one space, of course, it's uh, TCS. With they have high gross margins, uh, they have the highest margins as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Vinod. Yeah, Mr. Uh, Arnand Subramanian asks, uh, still in the hospitals is soft skills only, right? Uh, I mean, like I said, uh, uh, the use cases probably for each, uh, hosp I mean, for hospitals, for each sector, it's it varies. But uh, it, it, uh, it definitely is not just soft skills. Like I said, you can probably make, uh, you know, recommendations and uh, it can analyze what's wrong with the patient. It can improve health outcomes as well. Of course, you can also use it for uh, personalized marketing for the hospitals uh, and so on. So, yeah, th there'll be varying outcomes. Yeah, Mr. Kiran asks, uh, how about future growth prospects and advantages of pure product companies like Nugen? So, um, so the I mean, so for uh, those kind of product companies, so you are you have to look at, for, I mean, you have to look, uh, you know, evaluate those companies individually. So you have to look at it bottoms up. You have to see how good their product is whether they're vertical market software, whether they're horizontal, how good their sales uh, team is, which markets they cater to, what's their uh, retention ratio, and so on. So there are a lot of things you'll have to look at and you have to uh, you know evaluate each company individually. Yeah, if you have any other questions, you can put on the chat. So Mr. Uh, Jay Prakash asks, is any company doing good in the data center space? So I think the number of companies itself uh, is limited, but uh, uh, yeah, I leave it at that. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Kiran.
yeah i think uh, the uh, the pra- the webinar will be uploaded on youtube so you 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 know we can you can see it there yeah so uh, it allocation in specifically to the true blue portfolio is close to uh, it's about uh, between 16 to 17% close to 17% So we are, you know, significantly uh, overweight compared to the uh, Nifty 50 in uh, in the IT space. Okay, I think uh, that's probably the last of the questions. So thank you everyone for joining us once again and uh, hope you hope it was uh, useful for you. If you have any uh, questions about I thought our products and especially True Blue, please contact uh, or reach any one of my colleagues and they'd be happy to help and guide you. Thank you and have a nice day.